Stay hungry, stay foolish. The Innovation Show is proudly brought to you by Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Alexander Schultzenitsen once wrote that well-fed horses don't rampage. I interpret his words to mean that if we are not well fed from an emotional perspective, from a societal perspective, with purpose and with factual information, apart from the physical aspect of being fed physically, our minds can run amok. Our guest today asks, are we wired for hate? Is social media to blame? And what can we do about it? He has spent 20 years as a criminologist asking such questions and building technology and writing this book amongst many other papers to find out the answers to those questions. He is the author of The Science of Hate, How Prejudice Becomes Hate and What We Can Do About It. He is Professor Matt Williams. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. It's great to have you on the show, Matt. I thought we'd start with that fateful sliding door moment on Tottenham Road when everything changed for you. And luckily for the rest of us, I know it wasn't something I would wish on anybody, but it certainly sent you on a path that is helping humanity in ways that we're about to unveil. But let's tell our audience what happened on that fateful night. It was one of those difficult things to write, actually, in the book. I mean, there were lots of parts of the book that were difficult to write, but um, this was difficult for a different reason it, because it's so personal um and i'd not really written about it or talked about it for for decades but it was back in the late 1990s and i had just uh finished my undergraduate degree in sociology and i was out celebrating with friends in london uh who had also finished their studies and you know we had gone for drinks and then we went for lunch and then we bit a bit a bit of basking in regent's park and you know, we were having a great old time. Um, then we decided to carry on the party. So we went to a, a club on Tottenham Court Road. That, that, put it this way, it was known for the diversity of its clientele, otherwise known as a, a gay bar, if you like. And, you know, we were in there um, having a, a great time dancing, drinking. Um, and I popped out at, at one moment just to have a cigarette. And as I was outside that bar, you know, uh, it, uh, sort of basking in the glorious sunshine that day in London, um, I saw this guy coming towards me, sort of sauntering across the pavement. And uh, he just sort of looked at me and said, hey, uh, can I grab a light? And I was like, yeah, sure, man. You, you know, here's, your, here's your light. Got the zipper out of my pocket, flicked the flint, you know. And all of a sudden, within, within a split second, I was kind of on the floor and I was just looking up and just kind of my head was buzzing at a dim in my in my head and then i could taste this kind of metallic tang and oh, like, licking my lip and i could say geez I'm, no i had a split lip and i'd been attacked in that moment i'd realized that wow that that's crazy what what just happened and then as i was trying to fathom it out i could i could see the guy who'd asked for the light in in front of me and he was kind of joined with two other guys um and they were laughing with each other um and kind of pointing at me and and then it came it came out and there was a homophobic slur thrown my way and uh in that instant i knew i was a victim of a homophobic hate crime attack and it was just it was the first time it ever happened to me um i i kind of knew that it could happen at some point you know i was aware because i had friends that had suffered similar experiences in the past and it was only a matter of time i felt before i you know before i be fell victim to such an attack and uh they kind of walked away and i i didn't do anything i didn't want to kind of inflame the situation i didn't retaliate i felt a bit like a coward for not doing so but i thought do you know what? if i just leave it and let them carry on give them the prize that they they were uh, uh, seeking that they would just leave me alone and maybe leave others behind me alone as well you know just in case they they attacked other people and yeah i i, I didn't tell anyone at that point in time i was i just going to keep quiet about this um i didn't tell the police i was afraid to go to the police i didn't want to come out to the police I, you know i just thought at the time i was conscious that while relationships between sort of gay communities and 
and the police were getting better you know for the in the 80s the 70s 80s you know and early 90s there was a pretty marred relationship between law enforcement and 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 gay people and i i was kind of influenced by that so i didn't trust the police very much also there was no hate crime law to protect me at that point in time that didn't come in until say five years after my attack so there was no specific uh homophobic hate crime that could be recorded so they could record they could have recorded the crime against my body but not against my identity um and i felt that that was that was severely problematic in in the UK. I said we're living we're living in one of the most advanced democracies in the world, and you know I feel underprotected um, because you know there is no law protecting me, a vulnerable individual, uh, because of my identity. And it sent me on this in this interesting path. I mean, of course, it was a horrible experience. It traumatized me. Um, you know, I still suffer from anxiety today. I I still don't hold my husband's hand in public you know I, I have a fear of displaying affection towards men in public and I think it stems from that um encounter um but what it did to me not only reshaped my personal life it also reshaped my professional life uh, after my degree I was interested in becoming a journalist um and I was going to do a an MA in journalism in Cardiff um and it was all set I'd applied and accepted and and then I was like, well, I just need to understand why my attackers did that to me that day. Why was I the one that they picked? Why did they hate me? If hate was the right word to encapsulate what they felt towards me. Um, you know, what was the motivation behind that? Were they disgusted by me to such an extent that they had to they had to display their kind of animosity towards me or they wanted to eradicate me or in some way? Was I sort of in some way um, invading their territory or invading their turf and they were just kind of uh, redrawing those boundaries for me symbolically saying you're not you don't belong here in our city get back to where you belong kind of thing you know or was it something to do with you know one of them or all of them trying to prove their masculinity to each other you know and saying well let's go beat up a gay guy that'll just prove how masculine I really am and Maybe one of them was struggling with an intrapsychic kind of issue to do with their own sexual orientation. You know, maybe they an attack on a gay person kind of reinforced their heterosexual. I had all these questions. You know, there's a lot of things going through my head at that point. And there were so many questions that they just filled my thought process so much that there was literally no space for anything else. You know, I could could barely think about daily stuff without one of these thoughts creeping in. And I thought, I've got to do something about this. And that's why I shifted career paths. And I thought, well, obviously, criminology would be the place to to go to figure out some of these answers to these questions. And I quickly applied for the MSc in criminology at Cardiff instead of the journalism course. And that's the rest is history, you know. Um, and, and here I am today, you know, over 20 years later, having studied this subject for all that time and, and now – hopefully uh, uh encapsulating it in in that book behind my head right there um 20 years of everything i've learned uh written hopefully in an accessible way so uh, the stuff i've learned i can convey to a general audience because I, I i really think now even though that attack was over 20 years ago i just think everything's just got so much worse uh um in the last you know decade if not the last five years it seems to have accelerated so i just felt it was the right time to to share what I've learned with with that with as many people as I could. When you're telling me that so many questions pop into my mind, and throughout the book, you've answered those questions, you've certainly shone a light on so many of them, like, to many, this just, they'll hear the story of your attack. But they may not think about the impact. So and, and we won't have time to go all here. And I'm just gonna signpost for those who are interested in this in the book, Matt goes into, for example, well, what does that do to the individual? How does that impact their brain? How does the amygdala pass on deep seated fears on to the hippocampus into the hippocampus for long term memory storage? How does that affect how does it become trauma later on in life? All those type of things are catered for including, well, what are the accelerants for hate? What was going on in the lives of those people who attacked you? you you'd no idea. But also then, and what we'll talk about for sure, and we'll probably dedicate an entire episode to is 
bringing on hate onto social media as well and what that does because that becomes a whole different ball game and that is a huge part of what Matt does with his program called Hate Lab in Cardiff University about to spin out as well for any investors out there who are interested in as well as well get in touch with Matt but this is so important all these kind of questions and we're going to do a, a specific episode on the brain because questions come to mind is is hate hardwired in us, us versus them? What happens when we experience hate, but also how do we become hateful? And can we change the environment for that to happen? And then also we'll do an entire episode on the bots and algorithms and echo chambers, etc, and filter engines and how that all impacts people's knowledge and how they actually make decisions and how they think everybody's with me on this etc, uh, etc. Et so many questions come to mind. But I thought one was quite interesting for the our audience, Matt, which is many of our audience work in innovation. And in innovation, what also is an, an enemy of innovation is silos and organizations. So information is siloed, marketing's over there, sales over there, they need to be speaking to each other to understand different things. And your choice to go into criminology is one of those fields that's very much de siloed with where it looks for knowledge, because you really need to get a holistic view. And I thought that'd be really interesting to share from your perspective of, if you're going to look at all these questions, then you need to look at it from many different fields, many different disciplines. Yes, yeah, a great observation. And uh, I want to touch upon in, in the book. And it's an interesting subject, because it developed long after some of the major disciplines like psychology, economics, sociology, it's it, it really kind of uh, emerged in say the 60s in the UK and in America. Um, it, there was something called sort of the deviancy movement or the the sociology of deviancy. Um, and it became a, a, a sort of a split off subject from say, sociology, but other disciplines like psychology have their own versions like forensic psychology. And what's interesting about criminology as a field is that it is designed specifically to address um, social problems, uh, the social problem of crime. Um, so it's very policy related. It's 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 very practically orientated. You know, we work a lot with police, probation, social work, education, housing, to address the problem of crime, to try to understand what the causes of crime are and what the best uh, reaction or control mechanisms uh, you have to to um, to prevent crime and 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 um, you know prevent recidivism as we call it. And the exciting thing about that approach, when you're when you're you're gathering and, and coalescing around a problem, is that you bring to bear the information um, from multiple different disciplines because you need to to pull in as much information as possible from all different corners, all different traditions. So we draw on sociology, for example, how structures, how people organize in society, how organizations interact with uh, communities to understand the crime problem. We're also able to draw on psychology, look within and between small groups of people. So what is it inside a person, psychologically speaking, all the way from their biology, their hormones, their neuroscience, all the way to how how a person might interact with uh, another person in a in a close encounter, you know, that is important to, to understand violence, right? And that you have to understand that kind of interactional nature of, of how human beings function in order to get at that. So psychology is also incredibly important. And the book draws heavily on psychology to understand hate, but also, you know, computer science, uh, as you as you mentioned, you know, in hate lab, um, our university a unit, we we develop new technologies to monitor new forms of hate, uh, such as hate speech on social media and divisive disinformation around elections. It's so important to understand how human behavior is now migrated from the streets into these online spaces, so we can fully understand the full spectrum of human existence in relation to deviance and crime, and in this case, hate crime. So we have to work with computer scientists to understand this new context. You know, I'm not a trained computer scientist, I cannot code, you know, I understand technology quite well. But you know, when it comes to getting underneath the bonnet, I'm at a, I'm at a loss. Um, so we partner with computer scientists uh, in Cardiff and around the world, 
to enable us to look into that world in in a really forensic way. And it's quite exciting. Bringing all these different disciplines together to try and understand the subject is is very powerful. And you're right, you know, in innovation, you need to be doing that a lot more. Uh, silo thinking is the enemy of innovation. And it's the same for science. You know, we need to be as interdisciplinary as we possibly can to address this problem. And the book, in some way, hopefully uh, brings together computer science, uh, uh, it brings together neuroscience, biology, sociology, economics, uh, um, politics, just to address this problem all the way uh, from sort of what happens in the brain, right the way through to what's currently happening in AI and what might come in the future. You say in the book, much of the understanding of criminology comes from a study of prejudices and how we make rash decisions. We've covered bias, for example, on the show recently in, in depth in many different episodes. But it's our quick decision making, our quick judgments of others. And then that's reinforced by social conditioning, people around us, maybe, as I mentioned in the introduction, political climates, social climates, times of abundance versus times of scarcity, unemployment, all these a aspects have a huge factor on hate really on how people think about those who are at the out group those people who are not within our group and i thought we'd talk about prejudice because this is understanding of this is almost like a baseline this is like this is level one before we can move on a little bit more in our discussion for for a very long time much of the research into hate um has been done by psychologists since the 19 50s, 60s, and onwards, really since the Second World War. And the, the Second World War was a catalyst for um, research into prejudice and hate and, and, and genocide because of what happened in Germany, of course. And there were quite a few of the, the sort of scholars that that started this this huge kind of movement in understanding human behavior and how we can be pushed to our worst behaviors under certain conditions was done by those who fled uh the war and ended up residing in 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 the united states and the uk for example and a lot of the foundational work is psychology so it's lots of little experiments with students in classrooms but also stuff that's a bit more in the wild and i go into all those studies in the book uh, um, to tell the story of how we now have built up this amazing body of work um that that really does shine a light on on why people hate you know um i, I i'm constantly asking do we know the solutions we do know the solutions actually uh, the lab experiments the field experiments um the the kind of uh, national and global scale research that was been that has been done over the last 60 70 years um has actually found out how we address the problem what we what we have problems doing is uh finding the will to implement the solutions in a practical sense you know so that's that's always the the, the tricky bit is implementation um but yeah so wh when we look at prejudice it's it's important to understand that we're all prejudiced you know we're not born prejudiced you know we are we are of course uh, more or less sort of blank slates when we come into this world um but our brains do function in a certain way because of evolution that means that we are prone or primed to be prejudiced. So for example, we do come into this world with a preference for being in a group over not being in a group. Um, and that groupishness is really important in understanding how the brain is wired. And you know, while it's rel relatively benign, this, this preference for being in one group over another, whatever that group might look like, and it can look like anything, um, it 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 can be weaponized um and uh, and folks can become prejudiced if enough societal economic and psychological things that happen and i call these accelerants in the book enough of these accelerants uh lay on top of this kind of this wiring that we have when we when we come into this world um but yeah i think an important revelation for me as well as 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 you know those reading the book is that because of the way culture has its way with us as we socialize are socialized into this world we're all prejudiced in one way or another um, we all might be a little bit sexist, a little bit homophobic, a little bit racist. We may not realize it, but our, our decision making is shaped by our interactions as we develop as young people. So, for example, if we're not in very mixed classrooms when we're educated, if we're not exposed to much literature from people different to us, 
we we end up generating massive preferences for people who look and act like us or speak like us. Um, and because of that, there's a chance that you may make decisions that are at the detriment of people different from you. And that's a bias. And it could be an unconscious bias. Um, so you may not be fully aware of it. Or it could be a conscious bias. It's something you are aware of, but you don't mind doing it, you know, because other people around you are making the same decisions. But these unconscious and conscious biases uh, re- rarely have significantly negative consequences outside of immediate environments. It's when they become prejudices, uh, uh, extreme prejudices, and even sort of hateful attitudes as they start to really, uh, really uh, have negative effects on individuals and whole groups. And it's when these prejudices uh, and attitudes are then ingrained in societal structures and organizations, uh, these prejudices become systemic. You, we've heard this over and over again about systemic racism. Then it's a structural problem. You know, these things are then embedded into institutions because we make up the institutions. You know, we are part of them. We create them. And, and when it's baked in to institutions, then we have all sorts of systematic, systemic problems flowing from that employment, education, healthcare, criminal justice, and so on and so forth. So the book really tries to convey to the reader that, you know, it's, it's it's not unusual for you to have a prejudice. You know, it may be benign. You may not act on it all the time, but being aware that you have it is important. And being aware of its potential impact in the future is key. And, you know, I I describe one of my internal prejudices in in the book because, you know, as, as you said, I, I am a gay man um, and I went through that process of coming out and it was a tough time. You know, I grew up in a very small village in Wales, a very male dominated rugby playing coal mining community. And, you know, it just, it just wasn't a great con- environment to come out as a homosexual, right? And, it, and the media at the time was very aggressive towards gay men. It was the HIV AIDS epidemic. We had uh, Margaret Thatcher introducing something called Section 28 that forbid teachers from teaching anything about homosexual relations in school. So, you know, I couldn't even talk to uh, school teachers about the confusion I was suffering and parents wouldn't talk about it either, you know, and it was just a tough time to to actually come out as a gay man. And of course, you know, being surrounded by all that negative information had its way with me. It it it, it did uh, program me in a way to, to have a bias um, against homosexuals. And I remember thinking to myself and being really conflicted, you know, I thinking, I don't want to be gay because if I'm gay, it, it, it's, it's bad because of all these things I'm reading and being told. Um, I'm more at risk of dying because of, of disease. I'm, I'm more at risk of being attacked because of my identity. You know, I, I'm not going to find love because it's going to be so difficult to find a partner. And it was all these negative things that filled my mind. And I was just thinking to myself, I just don't want to be gay. Then I went to university. (laughs) Of course, everything changed because I was surrounded by much more liberal individuals and and, um, it's a very freeing experience. And that's when I was able to come out. But I remember thinking to myself, wow, I had like severe internalized homophobia when I was kind of in school uh, back home. I I was feeling and I had worldviews about homosexuals that weren't a million miles away from someone who was like, properly homophobic and that dawned upon me is that well it's not my fault that I felt like that it feels like it's not my fault because I was bombarded with all this information and then when I kind of went to uni and was exposed to new information and new viewpoints and I I, I developed sort of the cognitive tools the capacity to question information to be critical about information that I I could unpack what was going on in my head and, and how that internalized homophobia was then Deprogram, I deprogram myself in a sense. And I think that points to the importance of having those critical faculties ed, uh, in, sort of uh, impregnated into our kids at an early age. So they do question information coming towards them. They do question information they see in books and on the internet. They don't just absorb it without question. I think it's important that we develop these critical uh, uh, sort of skills in young people so they can question you know, and that's what happened with me. I was given those tools by my education, and I was then able to kind of form my own true opinion of 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 the world. And it's just fascinating to have gone from that that one position where I could see that 
culture was having its way with me and I was just kind of kind of going along, flowing down that kind of river and, and really not fighting against the stream to actually then starting to question. And um, it, I'm, I'm so pleased that I was able to do that, obviously. And I had to do it because I think I wouldn't have survived being a gay man, you know, having these feelings and mentally thinking that this is wrong. I mean, those the, the, that that kind of conflict was not sustainable, you know, which is why you see so many, you know, gay men and women take their own lives because when they can't reconcile those two things, they can, it can be that disastrous. Um, and I wrote the book to enable other people to to see the world that way, or at least to kind of expose the the potential that they have uh, prejudices. And I give them some ideas on how to then challenge those prejudices. There's so much in it again, and my mind's jumping all over the place, because you do cover every aspect of this, like the science of hate, it's the computer science of hate, it's the neuroscience of hate, it's many different sciences of hate. I thought, firstly, when you were saying that about your internalized bias, so for our audience, that's internalized bias, where you're almost biased against yourself. And it reminded me of the harrowing Clark doll experiments, essentially for our audience, the black kids preferred white dolls. And when they described the black dolls, they called them nasty names, and they said they were evil and bad, etc. And it was absolutely horrible. And, and that's a that's what we're trying to prevent here, because it's like, well, I wish I was just normal. And very much so, Matt, our audience, I celebrate the fact that we're neuro atypical, most of the audience who listen to this, I'm sure, because you got to be to be a different thinker. And that's something to be celebrated, and should not be you should not be castigated for that in any way. So that, that was one thing that came to mind. But then I want to get back to the book, because there's an understanding of different terms that's quite useful. So one of the terms that you talk about is intergroup hate. That's an important aspect of all of this, because this is where, again, and I keep bringing it back to innovation, that's my bias, where you have this clash of worldviews. And when there's a clash of worldviews, of course, those people over there, they just don't get it, they're evil, etc. And you get this in innovation as well from the people trying to drive the change versus those people in the status quo, the status quo will battle those people trying to drive change. So intergroup hate is one thing and intergroup that clash. Then there was the all port study. So I was thinking about this, the the levels of prejudice, because that's important as well, because you have a way of kind of categorizing this, the different levels of prejudice that we see five from memory, there are five different. And then the last thing I hope, <laughs> I hope you can remember all this was the important aspect of push versus pull. That's another very important aspect. And then w perhaps from there, once we have an understanding of that we can get deeper into some of the ideas from the book. There's a lot there, isn't there? I mean, yeah, the book is pretty expansive in terms of its reach, but but hate is expansive. You know, human behavior is so complicated that we have to take this kind of um, cast this wide net to 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 bring to bear as many areas uh, as we can in terms of where it can manifest and what forms of science we could we can use to understand it. But yeah, I mean, you mentioned there um, this notion of intergroup hate versus other forms of hate, and the book does does start off with sort of a few of the definitional challenges that we have, and you know some folks say, "Oh, I hate vegetables," or "I hate that president," or "I I hate this person," "hate that person," you know. And the question we've got to ask ourselves is, you know, hate, the, the term "hate" is used so frequently and so casually uh, in conversations that we we have to question whether or not. Uh, it's it's being used in the appropriate way. You know, do you actually hate vegetables? You know, it, I don't think you probably do hate, you just dislike them. You know, you don't like the taste. It's not hatred. Do you hate the president? Well, you don't really know them, really. You know, you just have this kind of contempt for them, you know. So it, the book breaks uh, breaks down the kind of emotional elements of, of negative feeling and then tries to map it onto a, 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 a broader structure to try and understand what is hate and what is not. Um, that's not to say you cannot hate an individual just because of who they who they actually are as a, as that individual. You know, someone can do something terrible to you, subject you to years and years of abuse, for example, and you know that that form of hatred is is palpable, and you probably do experience something akin to hatred. But where most of the science has been focused is on this intergroup hatred, so this in group out group dynamic. And when someone says they hate someone, it's usually because they form part of another group. 
So it's it's their association with the outgroup that uh, sort of inspires the the hatred. For example, it's not the individual themselves and their very individualistic, uh, precise, uh, unique qualities. It's it's actually the qualities that they share with the group that tend to be the focus of their hatred, and that's and that's potentially, I would argue, a more insidious form of hatred, because that's the kind of hatred that can lead to things like genocide, where you end up wiping out whole segments of society, because you think that individual is part of that group, and they can be nothing else. And that group has all these terrible qualities. And all of a sudden, you just brand every individual in that group the same way without even understanding their personal circumstances or their personal life stories. You don't even try to empathize with them because you see them as part of a whole other group, which is demonized for some reason. And that's uh, that's the form of hatred that that we concern ourselves with in, with in the science because of the potential consequences of it. And and Allport, as you said in his classic study in the 1950s, uh, I think the book was called "The Nature of Prejudice," was tasked um, to understand you know uh, how human beings can be pushed to such a such an extent that they could exterminate a whole race of people. And you know, obviously, the thing that comes to mind is. The, the Holocaust the genocide in, 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 in World War II. Um, he did an expansive project back in the 50s and, and came up with this hierarchy of hatred. And so basically it was from uh, the low end, which is kind of the milder stuff, right up to the, the top, which is this, the, the extermination end. And it's a useful way, not a perfect way, but a useful way for understanding where we are as a society in terms of how close we are to that 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 point of annihilation um and it begins very very um straightforward with kind of name calling and and just this sort of casual casual forms of bigotry and racism um partly unconscious some conscious you know and it's 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 almost kind of invisible and it can occur in societies quite naturally as i just said at the beginning of the podcast and then it moves progressively to more uh, sort of explicit forms of discrimination you know you get segregation for example as we saw in Jim Crow era America, um, then it goes a step further when we see open violence on the streets and with, with, with no consequence. You know, even the police are, are engaging in, in these acts of violence and right up to that a terrifying uh, uh, stage of, of genocide. So it's it's a, it, a and he, he casts it as a sort of a pyramid of hate, if you like. And there's an illustration in the book that kind of captures that, and it's useful for understanding. Um, how things can accelerate so much. But the book then goes into understanding how we move between those stages, you know, how we get from stage one to stage two to stage three and so on. What is it that we need in society uh, to, to develop along those stages to allow these, these sort of mass violations of, of human and personal rights to occur without, without question. Um, and that's where the sort of accelerants are, come in, which is, you know, this notion that, for example, that we can suffer personal losses and community losses that we need to find a scapegoat to blame. You know, very, we see this happen all the time up and down the country and across the world. And very often, you know, um, we, we like to place the blame on people different from us. It's too painful to blame our parents. It's too painful to blame ourselves. It's much easier to blame the person who's slightly different from you. And if you can find a way of doing that, um, then it's the sort of the easier road to go down. And a lot of scapegoating occurs under those conditions. Um, then we move on to uh, other elements such as radicalization, but also things like uh, uh, um, uh, trigger events, uh, isolated events that uh, cause us to perceive a bigger chasm between my group and your group. So, for example, a terror attack might occur and it's perpetrated by a member of the outgroup and all of a sudden you associate everybody uh, um, in that group uh, with the act that has just been perpetrated, that terror act. And all of a sudden you think, well, if it was an ISIS terror attack, you might be thinking, well, all Muslims are dangerous and I'm scared of all Muslims because they've just attacked my country, you know, and of course that's nonsense. Uh, this, the sort of evidence doesn't bear that out, but ultimately in moments of, of sheer panic and shock after a trigger event, all that kind of rational thinking can fall to one, one side. And that's why these kinds of events are so important and act as accelerants to hatred. And then it goes right the way through, of course, to how, how the internet and AI is making just everything so much worse because of the way these algorithms actually work. Important as well as the pull versus push factor. Yeah. It's an interesting way to, to sort of delineate prejudice from hatred, you know, um, 
And it kind of builds on some of that uh, work that uh, Gordon Allport pioneered back in the 1960s. And basically, the, the argument goes like this. If we have a, a sort of an internal prejudice, an unconscious prejudice or a conscious prejudice against another group, very often we avoid that group. We push them away. So we don't live in the same neighborhood as them. We don't have our kids socialize with kids that they have. Um, if we uh, encounter them on the street, we cross to the other side of the road. Um, if we have an encounter with them that we have to endure, we get anxious uh, in that encounter because we're not sure what the right thing to say is. You, you're afraid you might expose your prejudice to them in the way you speak to them. You may give them less time. And all these kind of negative feelings that you have um, about a group force you to push them away. You kind of want to avoid them. You don't want to be around them, whatever what, whatever them are. Um, hate is slightly different from that. Hate, when your prejudice becomes incredibly moralized and and becomes more of a, a full-time occupation, if you like, um, you pull the people you don't like or you feel hatred towards towards you. So there's this push-pull factor. You push people you kind of have a prejudice against away from you, but the people you hate, you will pull towards you in order to correct them, teach them a lesson, uh, uh, you know, attack them in some way. And what happened with me, for example, in my attack was that those guys who were waiting around patiently outside that gay bar in the 1990s sought me out. They came for me. They pulled me towards them. They didn't push me away. They didn't avoid the gay bar. They didn't say, I'm not going to walk down that. I'm not going to walk by that gay bar. They didn't cross the road to avoid the gay bar. They came towards that gay bar in order to select their victim. And this is the, this is the one key difference, I think, between prejudice and hate is that kind of push pull factor. If you think about World War II, for example, and, and, and Nazi Germany, they spent a ridiculous amount of money, uh, and spent a lot of resource and time on exterminating the Jews. For the attempted extermination of, of of that race, and ultimately, it obviously was devastating. Um, but surely, they may have won the war if they had allocated those resources differently. They were fighting a war on two fronts at one point, you know, and if they had allocated resources differently, they may have succeeded, and they didn't. And so, what this tells you is that hatred is, in fact, very irrational. You know, it's not driven by rationality, really. It's driven by a very deeply moralistic sort of uh, um, underpinning uh, uh, driving force. And uh, when you when you start to speak to people who, who have a hatred, their language is very moralistic. It's all about, you know, my values are being infringed upon by this other group. Their morals are directly uh, opposite to mine. In some way, and and it, it gets it gets so deep that they have this kind of this visceral reaction to to the whole group, um, and it's interesting because you can even see it in the behaviours of of people who are arrested for hate crimes. So, uh, an amazing study was conducted in Boston in the eighties, um, and they they looked at uh, uh, the different types of hate crimes that were occurring in that in that city at that time, and they identified a variety of of types if you like so you have at the at the low end of the spectrum sort of the thrill seeking haters so these are the casual haters they are part timers they may also do other criminal activity like shoplifting and and whatever else stealing drugs um but they also dabble a bit in hate so they may have a very soft prejudice um they may for example uh, become violent at some point with people from another group but they're not full timers they don't they don't label themselves as sort of maybe a member of the far right or, or or another extremist group they do it they do it for um enjoyment so for example proving their their masculinity to their their friends or their gang members etc then we have retaliatory haters these these are the type of haters who react in the moment to an event so for example i mentioned trigger events earlier on we get retaliatory haters um activating 
in the 24 to 48 hours after a trigger event. So a terror attack occurs. Uh, and within the 24 hours, 48 hours afterwards, lots of individuals with a degree of prejudice are activated in the, in those moments. And they may take to social media to say something uh, sort of racist or, or, or anti-religious uh, on on Twitter or something, or they may take to the streets and, and, and shout slurs to people on public transport that they think look like or they're from the group that the perpetrator is from. And they're just retaliating to, to that, to that attack, but their prejudices are activated by that event. And then after about 48 hours after the event wanes, they, they stop retaliating. So it's, it's still a part time kind of occupation for them. The next level up are defensive haters. And these are all about defending territory. So these are not necessarily triggered by events, but more incursions into territory. So for example, if a, you know, a gay couple moved into a street or a black couple moved into a street that was predominantly white or predominantly heterosexual, uh, there may be instances of of uh, anti anti social behavior, neighborhood disputes that have a distinct tinge of homophobia or racism about them, um, and that may escalate to something more grim. Uh, there's a this example in the book of Bishan Ebrahimi, who's a um, uh, a guy from um, the Middle East who moves into a predominantly white area in Bristol in the UK, and he is subject to a uh, a campaign of hatred for many, many years and is eventually killed, um, by, by a white guy in that neighborhood, you know, and that's a really good example of this kind of defensive, defensive type of hate. And again, these haters aren't full timers. They, they only are activated when, when an incursion occurs and they feel like they need to protect their territory and, and redraw those boundaries. At the top end of that spectrum are, are the mission haters. These, these are actually the worst breed of of haters they are the full timers they are the ones who live their life uh, by hatred they are members of the far right groups um you know they 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 establish the far right groups they join far right groups they collaborate together they understand the world very much so as as versus them and they and they invest heavily in sort of conspiracy theories such as replacement theories and and whatnot they live their lives as as haters um and thankfully there are not many of them out there i do feel they might be growing in number but you know the most extreme full-time haters those mission haters um uh, occupy that very top spot. So I think it's useful to understand hatred and those who perpetrate it on this continuum, because it gives us some more, I think, a more nuanced understanding of how it can manifest and why it can manifest in certain moments. I think the important point uh, about describing all of those people who occupy those positions is that events, incursions, uh, um, release prejudice. They don't create the prejudice that's already there, they release the prejudice in these individuals. And I think that's an important point that, that, that events, incursions, et cetera, perceived incursions are a releaser of prejudice, not creators of prejudice. Again, back to Ibrahimi, who, who passed away in Bristol. Again, it was slow. It was a, a fire that was ignited. It was catalyzed by other people almost condoning, oh, yeah, we need to get him out for whatever reason. And then if you think that and you bring that online, like we'll discuss in part two, you create this false reality that oh, everybody's on board, everybody's thinking this and, and there's a, almost like a feeling of I'm, I'm justified to this, I'm standing up for the rights of my community, etc. That's important. And that's I think that's really important as a parent or a guardian of the young to understand that because you can see how their worldviews can be created, particularly as we move increasingly, whether we like it or not onto the internet and their that's their communication platforms increasingly as well. And we're going to talk about that in depth because it's so, so important. But I thought we'd talk next about something you alluded to, you were reluctant to report your own case, your own crime against you, which raises both there was a different reason behind that. Back then it was you were, you hadn't fully come out yet, you didn't want to come out to the police, etc. But it does raise as you do later on through some of the harrowing cases. And by the way, I just want to let our audience know, I'm, I'm not going to go into the harrowing cases, because they are, 
as as you'll read about later or you listen to us later on when we talk about the brain my insula that part of my brain that that really gets in touch with my empathy as well i felt sick to my stomach reading those case studies as well because they are really hor- horrible and i'm as matt said to me very very difficult to write for him as well and very difficult to research but they happened and that's the point and we need to shine a light on the fact that they happened there's many many different cases from corrective rape to downright racism by the police etc in the US and they're all in the book but we're, we're going to draw on the lessons from them because one of the things that does come forth and particularly this is very very geographic in nature and also it has to do with corrective measures in those countries. So how criminalization, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Also police education comes into play and then a willingness or a lack of willingness by both victim and witness to come forth and say when something has happened. And there's a multitude of reasons for this. Again, this can be from your your experience to both. Well, I can't I can't tell the police because the police won't believe me because I'm the wrong color or I'm the I'm part of the wrong group. All those things have a massive aspect in what you've studied, which is the statistics of hate around the world. That's right. And um, some folks might find statistics a bit dry, but um, if you if you want to understand how statistics work and don't work, one of the best ways to to look at it uh, is through the lens of hate crime uh, uh, statistics, because they vary so dramatically across the world. I mean, one example I always give is that, you know, last year in the UK, there were over 100,000 reported cases of hate crime to the police, over 100,000 cases. Uh, In the US, we were just touching around uh, 8,000 in the US. And that's just a ridiculous disparity in the numbers. And of course, it's not because the UK is incredibly racist, homophobic, disabled, etc. And the US is is not. It's about how we count and how we decide to count and what not to count uh, and what to count. And it's 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 all about organisations and police uh, uh, forces uh, recognising hate when they see it. It's also about victims recognising hate when they see it and it happens to them and 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 witnesses too. And it's it the whole process, the whole recording process is very complicated, as you can imagine. The book does walk the reader through how this how this process varies by country. But ultimately, um, to be counted as a hate crime victim really does depend on what country you live in. So, for example, if you live in the United States, it's much less safe for you as a minority because the chances of you being counted as a as a hate crime victim are much lower than if you reside in the UK. So the UK, for me, is a much safer place to be as a a minority individual. Um, Why do these differences exist? It's all to do with historical political context. It's all to do with uh, institutionalized homophobia, racism, etc. It's also to do with how police forces are structured. You know, the police in the UK are a bit more centralized than they might be in the United States, because you've got states and the federal government and and so on and so forth. So there's a lot going on there. um, That that means that what's counted and what's not counted varies dramatically, uh, even between states in America. But the most important thing I think, uh, for me, um, is, is, is in understanding how the statistics work is, is is recognizing who doesn't get counted, you know, and I didn't get counted back 20 or so years ago in the UK, I would be counted now. But there are so many groups out there that suffer hate crime attacks that still don't get counted. And in there, in the book, I detail the case of Sophie Lancaster, who was uh, murdered for being different um, up in, 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 in the north of England, um, quite a few years ago now, but she was, uh, for example, a uh, uh, a member of an alternative subculture. She would classically be called an emo or a goth, if you like. She she dressed in in, in sort of black clothing, had lots of piercings, had braided hair, um, and was a member of an alternative subculture. She looked different, and she was attacked and killed because she looked different. No other reason. It was precisely because she looked different uh, that she was killed. Um, she wasn't recorded as a hate crime statistic in the UK. The judge recognized that she was 
killed for being different and actually said in his summing up and, and sentencing that you know you were attacked because you you had a different identity to your attackers uh, and they're animals for doing that not even you know animals would do would would conduct such an act um so you know you 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 are worse than animals um and you know they in their in their in their reasoning for the attack they also verbalized difference as a key motivator but the law wasn't there to to allow the judge to sentence them to a, a significantly longer period of time in prison um, because they were unrecognized in law. And they still are unrecognized in law, groups of individuals who occupy a position in alternative subcultures. And it's important to understand that, you know, what the state decides to count and what it decides not to count is has serious consequences. It has serious consequences, practically speaking, because, of course, you know, you have less fewer tools and mechanisms at your disposal as a judge to pass a more severe sentence. A more severe sentences are more deterring. You know, if you know you're going to get sent down for longer, you'll think a bit harder about committing the act of act, whatever that act might be. It sends it sends a message to the nation as a whole. You know, if a, a piece of legislation goes through Parliament and it says we're now recognizing, say, for example, gender uh, violence as a hate crime, that communicates to the to the population that you know that that unit there, that the folks in in the Houses of Parliament have decided that it's important enough to recognise as a as a hate crime that attracts more severe punishment, and you know the law is an important signal, you know, and who gets counted and who doesn't counted really does matter. Um, we're quite fortunate in the UK, you know, there are lots of categories that are recognised, and and there are lots of individuals that are have additional or extra protections because of the law. But outside of the UK, the variation is vast. So, for example, you know, in, in Japan, there are no hate crime laws to speak of whatsoever, which is just crazy. You don't have, you have very few in Russia. You look at Europe and it's very sporadic, you know. For example, I always tell my students, you know, they I show them a map of Europe and the number of hate crimes occurring in different states in Europe. And I think one year um, there was one hate crime in Greece one in the whole of Greece. And I'm like, what is that telling us? It's telling us that they're ignoring hate crimes occurring in that country, you know, and it's got better since since that point in time. Um, but, you know, the statistics never tell the full story. And a big part of it is is what's counted. But another big part of it is that issue of trust and minority populations. If there is this kind of tension between a minority group and police and the state, for some reason, because the state has persecuted them via the police, they're not going to report their victimization. I mean, why would you expose yourself? There's a, there's a case in the book I talk about where uh, um, before my attack, there's an example of a, a, a gay man who was raped by another man. He went into the police station to report the rape. He was arrested for the act of what was then called buggery. As, as the crime. Um, and he was put in a cell overnight with no medical attention or care. That was how the police reacted to the reporting of that, that hate crime and rape. You know, and, and that resonates with the community. You know, you don't forget that very easily. So stories like that, cases like that, really do sort of put up a barrier between you and the police. And you see this in America too. So for example, when when you see so many white cop on black uh, uh, community member shootings. You know, when you get so many shootings of young black men in America um, that indicate a degree of bias on the part of the police forces um, in the States, what what chance do you think there is of a person suffering a hate crime going to the police to report that? Zero, right? There's, n there's no chance that, that uh, that's going to happen. And in the book, I detail a very important sort of experimental study that that looked at the rates of engagement with the police from the black community in the days and weeks and months after a, a brutal killing of a of a young black man um and you know the statistics and the science shows that a massive drop off in engagement ensued after that moment and there are so many many killings of young black men in america that that's just going to have a, a fundamental impact on on engagement with that community uh, in both ways. So yeah, statistics are important, but they also tell um, 
very different pictures in different parts of the world. One last thing I thought we'd finish on before. So we're going to finish up this episode and we're going to come back for an episode about the internet was authority bias in a way where authority figures, when they become accelerants for prejudice and hate, it has a dramatic impact or political events such as Brexit, or as we said, <laughs> recent presidents, let's say in the US who had a dramatic effect on hate crimes, but also hate speech in the environment around them. And I thought it would be great to share the the comprehensive study you did in the hate lab, where you looked at not only statistics, but you looked at Facebook posts, you looked at whatever data that you could get your hands on. And the results were very revealing. Maybe we'll share this as a final message before we finish up this one and we go on then to the internet. It's a really good point to end on, I think. And it, it, it builds on this point I said earlier about the effect of trigger events and, and hate. And that hate as a crime, unlike most other crimes, is very temporal in its patterning. You know, it varies a lot by time. Most crimes vary a lot by area, wh whereas hate is is both temporal and spatial. Uh, and the temporal dimension is really kind of falls out along these these trigger events. And as you mentioned, you mentioned Brexit, and Brexit for us was a trigger event. Um, we saw one of the largest spikes in in recorded history of hate across the country um, and one of our uh, intentions in the hate lab was to identify what the conditions for that hatred were we wanted to know it was did hate crimes go up in every part of the country um, or were they located in certain parts of the country and for how long did that hate last and what were their, what were the drivers of it and we had a hypothesis that um, one of the major drivers was the way an area voted. So, for example, if an area was majority leave, would that affect the the hate crime hate crime rate in that area? Um, we also know, for example, that Northern Ireland uh, and Scotland largely voted to remain, whereas Wales and England largely voted to leave. So we compared results with the devolved nations as well. And yeah, uh, our statistics were advanced. We we work with econometricians. You know, these these are serious statisticians. Um, we we developed. Uh, very robust sort of statistical models to kind of really test this assumption that you know it, it wasn't it wasn't just a rise in recording and reporting that was responsible for that spike in hate it was actually because there was an increased perpetration more people took to the streets uh, to commit hate crimes because of the brexit vote what we found in our in our analysis and actually the paper comes out tomorrow uh believe it or not um which is uh um Actually, it's out today. Uh, it's out on the 30th of September. So it's actually published in the British Journal of Criminology, published today. Um, and Bravo, it, it showed, sir. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it took a long time to get this paper out. But it actually shows that um, those areas that voted more for leave um, saw the greatest rises in hate crime on the streets, which is a controversial thing to kind of to prove, I think. And I don't think that... Um, every person in a leave area is going to be very happy with that finding. But it, it was the only factor as well in those areas that, that predicted the rise in hate. So we controlled for things like uh, inward migration flow, you know, had lots of uh, new immigrants moved into that area in the last five years or not? What was the unemployment rate? What was the educational attainment rate? What was the health uh, of, of the population? And we, we controlled for everything we could possibly think of, including, as you said, what was being said on Facebook in those areas and so on and so forth. And once we controlled for all that stuff, the one factor that, that shone above all the rest was the vote and what um, and the magnitude of that vote. So what that tells us is that the vote itself was responsible for triggering certain individuals to release their prejudice on the streets in the in the, the month after the vote. And we calculate that the vote itself was responsible for an additional 1,100 hate crimes uh, had the vote not happened. You know, so that that's a staggering finding and 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 more proof that you know trigger events are incredibly important in understanding uh, the patterning of hate. I have so much questions, as you know, but I can't, <laughs> I can't take away from the hate lab for that much. And also, you have a weekend to get yourself to. I would love people to reach out to you. 
with queries perhaps about investment, for example, in your spin out, that's going to be, it's becoming an increasingly important aspect, particularly when it comes to the tech, which is what you focused on here, and what you probably had to create because it didn't exist. And we're going to focus on that in episode two, and then episode three, probably going to be my favorite, which is all about the brain. And we've done a recent episode, a recent series about the brain's beliefs and biases. So absolutely perfect for that. So understanding the brain and hate is so, so interesting. But next up, we're going to talk about the internet, filter bubbles, echo chambers, how you can create almost a false reality for people, particularly under those accelerants of hate, like, for example, fear, political turmoil, war, starvation, scarce resources, all those things have a, a dramatic effect on how we perceive information. Matt, for those people who do want to reach out to you, where can they find you? The best way is to go to hatelab.net, which is our lab webpage. Once again, the book is The Science of Hate, How Prejudice Becomes Hate and What We Can Do About It. It's a brilliant read, so many interesting aspects of it. As I said, Matt goes everywhere about the science of hate, and it is truly a remarkable piece of work. For now, author of The Science of Hate, Professor Matthew Williams, thank you for joining us. Thank you too. The Innovation Show is made possible by Zai boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com.